Aya ewe malaka koke ne nehi cheki kishikwa wainzuani nila miyamiya. So I'm a geologist at the Smithsonian Institution. If you ever wondered why would someone become a geologist, why would anyone want to do that for a living? Um, I'm going to let you in on a little secret. Some of you have known me for a long time. I only have sight in one eye. I've only ever had sight in one eye. And so I have no natural depth perception. So there are things I do that some people find quirky, like I sit and roast marshmallows not in the fire. or. <laughs> I don't shave with a blade because I've never actually seen this part of my face, even in a mirror. I'm a lot of fun to drive with. <laughs> and I learned to walk early on with my head down. So I'm an expert on things like carpets and tiles and linoleum. <laughs> but mostly I look at rocks. I love rocks. I've probably looked at millions, if not tens of millions of rocks over the year. And so I'm going to tell you a little bit about rocks, and then we're going to lead on. Because you probably see here a pile of rocks. But I don't see a pile of rocks. I see a pile of stories. Each of these rocks is its own little story. So let's just take this rock right there, and I'll tell you its story. That rock started off as an igneous rock, something that crystallized from molten rock in a mountain building episode. It was pushed up, and it was heated and metamorphosed. It changed, and eventually it was cracked, and hot water started flowing through it. That hot water hit the cooler rock, and it deposited quartz in there. And then eventually, that mountain was ground down. You know, the Appalachian Mountains used to be as high as the Rocky Mountains are today. It was ground down into this rounded form, and there that rock sits. And so you have to learn how to read these rocks. So I learned to read, both literally and geologically, in the Wabash Drainage Basin. Now, if you're not familiar with the drainage basin, the concept, if you see the yellow on here, if you were a drop of rain, and you landed anywhere in that yellow part, and you made it to a river, you're going to end up in the Wabash River sooner or later. And most of you are probably used to the upper reaches of the Wabash up here, the Mississinawa, the Eel, some of those rivers up here. I didn't grow up there. I grew up way over here in a little town called Mattoon, Illinois. I went to school in Charleston, Illinois, met my wife there. And the water we drank at that university came from the Embra River, one of the tributaries of the Wabash. And when I drive from my mom's house in Mattoon to my brother's house in a little town called Gaze, Illinois, we go across the exact point where the little Wabash starts and eventually flows into the Wabash. So I've been literally reading rocks for probably 50 years and understanding how to read those rocks for at least 30 years. And so when I see something like this, this is a place I saw once 12 years ago for 20 minutes and I will never leave my mind because this is out behind the Baldwin's house. They probably recognize it down on the creek there. I saw it literally for 20 minutes and I will never forget it. So how many of you see a waterfall here? Uh-huh. So I want you to stop. What do you feel between your toes right now? Because what I feel between my toes is not the water of the waterfall. What I feel between my toes is the mud that laid down these layers of shale. The mud from an ancient ocean, Mijmaha, long ago, hundreds of millions of years ago, when this entire area was covered by a, a shallow ocean, and in there, I can feel the warm mud between my feet. Can you feel it? That's what geologists do. We understand how to read these sorts of things. So I did occasionally look up. And when I looked up, I liked to look at places where depth perception didn't matter. I tended to look way up. <laughs> <laughs> I looked out into space. I find space in a fascinating place. And uh, it's a place where I always wondered as a kid growing up, what's out there? How can we find it out? How can we ever learn more about this? And as a consequence, I ended up going and getting way too many college degrees. Um, if you ever decide to go to three different colleges, just understand you're going to get letters from three different development offices. But um, <laughs> eventually, I got a PhD in uh, studying meteorites at the University of Hawaii. And I study these. These are iron meteorites. This is the Stanton, Virginia iron meteorite. This thing's about that big around. And this distinctive pattern, this is what most people think of as meteorites, these big chunks of metal. It has this distinctive cross-hatched pattern we call the Widmanstaaten pattern, after Aloysius von Widmanstaaten, who discovered it. And that pattern formed when this rock cooled at a few degrees C every million years, a few degrees Celsius, every million years, deep in the core of a molten asteroid. And so you're looking at something that is the equivalent of our Earth's core, and we'll get back to that. And I wanted to explore. I mean, we naturally are exploring people. And so where I explore is in space. 
And so I've worked on six spacecraft missions. This is one that probably mo resonates with most people. This is a, an artist concept of the Mars Exploration Rovers. I helped drive those around for five years on the surface of Mars, looking at rocks. So I've, I've literally worked everywhere in the solar system from the outer reaches of the asteroid belt almost to Jupiter, all the way into working on the deepest basins on the planet Mercury, and working from back in time four and a half billion years to the modern day. And so I've been all over our solar system in space and time. But there's always been one thing uh, that I never understood, and that was mounds. If you grow up anywhere between the Appalachian Mountains and the Mississippi River, you've seen mounds. You can't really miss them. When I was a kid, I went to Indian Mound Scout Reservation near Oconomowoc, Wisconsin. If you drive over to Indiana, you'll go to Mound State Park. Mounds are everywhere and of every size. Some of them are, are these little bitty things. You know, this is probably 10 feet, 15 feet high and almost indistinguishable from some of the glacial mounds that you'll find up in Wisconsin. Others are huge. This is Monk's Mound at the Cahokia site near St. Louis, named for a group of Trappist monks who lived the next mound over. And so, you know, th this is actually the tallest point in this county and is one of the tallest points in all of southern Illinois. Um, it was surpassed by a garbage mound up near Chicago a few years ago. <laughs> but, um, and so these mounds are literally everywhere. And so what I'm going to tell you about is what I've come to learn about mounds, and in one particular aspect, but more generally. But before I do that, I just want to tell you something about NAGPRA, because it's important that if we're going to talk about mounds, we talk about NAGPRA. Now, most of you are probably are familiar, or have at least heard the word. NAGPRA is the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act. It's an unfortunate truth that in the 1800s and the early half of the 1900s, a lot of Native American graves were desecrated by anthropologists and archaeologists. It is just a fact. And the NAGPRA was designed to, to right that wrong, to return those remains. Um, we at the Smithsonian are actually not subject to NAGPRA. NAGPRA came in after the National Museum of the American Indian Act, which governs the Smithsonian. It's very similar, but a slightly different act. And then that's been amended several times. And so I'm going to talk today about some Hopewell artifacts, not human remains. The things I'm going to talk about are not expeditions that, or excavations that we did at the Smithsonian. These are things that were done by the Illinois State Geological Survey, sometimes by those objects are now at the Field Museum long before any of our museums were established. But we do pay a particular attention, and the Smithsonian has had a close relationship with the tribe and repatriated several human remains. But when you go back into deep time, and we're going to go back about 2,000 years, it's actually very difficult. One of the things I have to worry about is cultural affiliation. And you'll hear more about that in the next talk. But in the, our, our policy at this moment, in the absence of cultural affiliation between a tribal community and the Hopewell, this group 2,000 years ago, so if you can't prove that you actually are directly descendant from the Hopewell, then repatriation is not required for funerary objects, not necessarily for human remains, but for funerary objects. And um, so things that were buried with human remains from Hopewell sites under NAGPRA. So I just want you to keep that in mind. I'll be happy to talk about this more. Realize I am not the NAGPRA officer for the Smithsonian, but I will talk about this a little bit. So these are the mounds that I've talked about a little bit. I'll come over here to this slide for a second. So mounds range all the way in here. You can imagine the Appalachian Mountains running up something you know, like this, up and down the East Coast. You can see there aren't very many that are east of the Appalachians. And really a, a central concentration all along the Mississippi, a few even getting out here into the tri-state area where many of you live today. I'm going to talk about four of these. We're going to start here at Serpent Mound. We're going to move up to Mound City, what is now Hopewell National Historical Park. We're going to come over here to the Havana Mound over here in central Illinois. And we're going to talk just briefly about the Trempolo up here. So just keep in mind geographically where we're going on this trip. So let's start with the Serpent Mound. So we're here in Oxford, Ohio. We're going to travel over here to the, the boundary between these two counties, and we're going to look at the Serpent Mound. Now, Serpent Mound is probably the best known effigy mound in the eastern United States. This is the Serpent Mound from above. Many of you have probably seen this before. It's about a quarter of a mile long. It's about, oh, three or four feet high. And it is this curving tail here, if I can get that to stay still, this curving tail that comes around in these, these coils back and forth that ultimately lead to this sort of straight section, this thing that looks a bit like a head, and then this, this round object. And I, I won't 
I'm not exactly sure what the round object is, but we'll talk a little bit about the symbolism of this in just a minute. So Serpent Mound has been the subject, subject of studies for a long time. And near Serpent Mound is a conical mound that is a burial mound. Serpent Mound, to the best of my knowledge, is not a burial mound per se. It's an effigy mound. There are no burials in the Serpent Mound. And there have been several studies done on it. It was first described in an 1848 publication by the Smithsonian and has been subsequently studied. The most recent publication was in about 2014. And a lot of these were excavations where they were designed to take soil samples and try to get radiocarbon dating. So radiocarbon dating is just looking at the decay of a radioactive element of carbon that's generated in the atmosphere. You are full of, ra of radioactive carbon right now. Um, and when you die, it stops being incorporated into your body, decays. So you can age date things back to about 20,000 years. In the 1996 paper, age dates were produced that were something like AD 1100. So just remember that, AD 1100, right? And, but then they went back and they did a much more detailed survey where they took deeper soil samples. And they also used something called a magnetometer. And so if you look, this is a magnetometer print here. And one of the things that's interesting, and this is just a measurement in what we call nano Teslas, but you can see that even here, there's this abandoned coil. So you notice how there was that straight section right before you got to the head on the other one? It actually appeared that there was at one time a coil there that was subsequently abandoned. But the ages from this most recent study are something like uh, 300 BC, right? So think about that. You have ages of 300 BC and 1100 AD. Well, geologists or archaeologists have divided this time. And so the earliest culture is the Adena. Um, in the middle is the Hopewell, which goes from about 200 BC to about 400 AD. And the most recent, starting about 1,000, um, I'm sorry, 1,000, yeah, this, you think of this as AD, uh, AD this, I'm sorry, this should be CE. So AD to about, oh, 1,700, something like that. But keep in mind the age dates that we have here are about 300 BC and about 1,100 AD. So that means for a period of more than 1,000 years, this mound was maintained or repaired. 1,000 years. Right? This 300 BC, to put that in a world perspective, that's when Aristotle studied under Plato in the Greek society. And so for a thousand years, this thing was, was maintained. But we know actually very little about these people. We have these archaeological objects, but we don't know what languages they spoke. We don't know what they called themselves. We're pretty certain they were not a homogenous group. Thinking of something like the Hopewell is equivalent to thinking of Eastern Woodlands tribes today, right? You would probably put the Ottawa and the Miamia and the Peoria and all those together, and you would think of that as Eastern Woodlands. But they spoke distinct language. We don't know what they called themselves. These names came from not from any language we have. We have no written records of their language. But for example, the Adena culture was named after Thomas Worthington's Adena Mansion near Chillicothe, Ohio. It actually originates from a Hebrew word meaning exquisite because that's what he thought his mansion was. <laughs> Hopewell was named for the family who owned the land near Chillicothe, Ohio, where the Hopewell mounds were built. And Fort Ancient is a site in Ohio. So there's a lot we don't know about these people. But we actually do know a fair bit about them. We know when. We also don't know why this exists, right? There's a lot of speculation. When you see this, when you see serpent, most people associate serpent and snake, right? A serpent is a snake. But a serpent isn't necessarily a snake. So we argued this in some work we did years ago, that in fact, serpents can be other things. So these are two objects. One was owned by a Miamia family. It was uh, apparently produced by an Ottawa man who made these for trade. It was made on Manitou Island. So this is the head of a Manitou, a water serpent, essentially. You can see it looks like a horse head here, but it has these, you notice these distinct ridges, right? Those look a little familiar, like the coils. And this is a bag that was actually in the art museum exhibit in, what, 2008. And it was flipped over there. You couldn't see this side. This is at the National Museum of Ameri American Indian. It's a Miamia bag. And the other side are, are the diamonds that you see in the patterns for ribbon work, chinguia, the chinguia diamonds. But this is the reverse side of that. And here you see this same sort of ridged design, right? And it kind of wraps around here, it comes back. 
you can almost follow it around like this. This is Lenapingia. This is the water serpent. Not a snake, but a mythical being, if you will. Uh, uh, I don't even know how to, a Manitou to describe this. And so the serpent mound may well not describe something that we think of as a snake. It may well describe something that was this Manitou. And there are other relationships here. But it's a really interesting thing that these sorts of ideas that may have existed in the Hopewell actually came through to the tribes we see today. Now, there's another really cool thing, because again, I like to look at rocks. And I was telling Jesse um, Baldwin at the time that I remember taking her on a field trip to look at rocks, and she could not believe that we were looking at rocks. Um, and yet, she found a turtle shell she was so excited about, I could not believe she cared about a turtle shell. <laughs> But if you go about three miles from Serpent Mound, there's some private property there. We got permission to go on there because we knew the guy from the Ohio Geological Survey. He got and you see these rocks. You see these distinct cone shapes? These cone shapes are extraordinarily rare on the surface of the Earth. They're only found in about 10 places on the entire surface of the Earth. They're called shatter cones. And they only form where a giant meteorite hits the ground and the shock wave produces the pressure to get these forms. These shatter cones are found by Serpent Mound because Serpent Mound sits inside an ancient, about 230 million year old, 10 mile diameter impact crater. Now it's easy to say that we know that today, but it's the only place in Ohio where the geology is heavily disturbed, where rocks, normally if you walk across Ohio, it's like walking across a layer cake. You get to one layer and then eventually you get to another layer and then eventually you get to a third layer. Here, the first layer and the third layer are right next to each other. And so this is not just a place that has this great historical significance, it has this fascinating geological story to it. And so these are the kind of things that we can learn from mounds. But I'm going to take you to another place because we really start to get into the, the material that was found in the mound. So we're going to go up here to the Mound City Group, to Chillicothe National Histor or, uh, Hopewell National Historical Park. This is the Mound City area, quite a pretty picture in here. And you can see the mounds in here, conical mounds, tabletop mounds. But the most amazing thing about the Hopewell is they had this funerary tradition. So they had these mounds with human remains, and in there are exotic objects. You can only describe them as exotic objects because they're not found around here. So you see things like, and things from the far reaches, so things that are close like galena. This is a lead sulfide. It makes quite a nice dark pigment. This comes from up around uh, the Quad Cities, today, what is today Illinois. You can go up here. Copper, many, many copper uh, effigy forms, other sorts of forms. Copper is found in the upper peninsula of Michigan. Oftentimes you'll find some silver that you have to go up into Ontario. These effigy, this is a hawk's claw. This is made from a mineral called mica. It makes a sheet, and they would cut these sheets. This only comes from the Appalachian Mountains. That's the closest source in here. Conch shells or whelk shells from the Gulf of Mexico. All of these can be found in a single mound. And even from all the way out here in what is today Yellowstone National Park, we can trace obsidian, this volcanic glass. We have people in our department today who study the same obsidian. So these are from thousands of miles away. The hope will move these things over vast distances and brought them together as funerary objects in these mounds. But one of the things that's in here, this is the reason I got involved, is because of these. These are beads. This is a centimeter cube. For those of you that thought you could forget about metrics after eighth grade, a <laughs> centimeter is a little less than half an inch. So this is a cubic. And these beads, you can see they're hollow, tube-shaped, rolled up here. They're about a centimeter, centimeter and a half in length. Sometimes they found together. These are from the Hopewell Mounds. These were excavated as part of that. And they're, you might not think anything about that, right? You find a bead. It's made of iron metal, whoop-de-doo, right? Because you think of iron metal as everywhere. I mean, your washing machine, your car, the structures of major buildings. If you found a nut or a bolt laying out in the ground, you wouldn't think twice about it. But if you excavate something that's 2,000 years old and you find metal, you know there's, you've got something really different. Because metal isn't found on the surface of the earth. We just don't see it today. All of this metal is made by taking iron oxide and reducing it to make iron metal. 
The reason is because all of the iron metal in the earth is in the core. We all le learned these again. Remember, we're going back to sixth grade science. So we all learned about the core, the mantle, and the crust. And the core, this big ball of metal, is about 2,000 miles below our feet. And when the earth was young and hot and it melted, all the metal sank to the center. This is the reason we have a magnetic field that protects us from cosmic rays. So we're 2,000 miles down. The deepest hole we've ever dug, ever, in all of mankind, is 10 miles deep. We're never going to touch this layer. It's impossible to go there. But occasionally, pieces of metal fall to the surface of the Earth. Because these asteroids, these things left over from the birth of the solar system, there are lots of them. Some of them melted, and they had cores. They run into each other. They break each other apart. And pieces of those cores, iron meteorites, fall to Earth. These are essentially a natural stainless steel. And these are so exciting, these balls of metal, that this is a mission I'm working on. This is called Psyche. This is actually approved for flight. Believe it or not, NASA gave us $700 million to do this crazy thing, that we're going to go to space, and we're going to see something called Psyche, an asteroid called Psyche that's 200 kilometers across, about 130 miles across. And it's a solid metal ball. It's the core of an ancient asteroid. All the rocky parts have been stripped off, and we get to go there. We get to launch in 2022. We get there in 2025. That's how excited we are about seeing these sorts of things, our first look at a metal world. But people have made things out of iron meteorites forever. So here are just a few of the things we have at the institution. This is one of the Hopewell beads, right? This is actually a presentation piece that was given to Ulysses S. Grant in 1871 from a delegation from Mexico. This thing looks like a necklace. Anyone? Anyone want to guess? It's a camel charm. It was made in Saudi Arabia from a meteorite there. And these we see all the time, knives. Knives where the blades are made of iron meteorites. We found them from King Tut's tomb. We found them from Chinese Bronze Age daggers. We found them from relatively modern objects like this one from Mexico. And so these iron meteorites are incredibly important. And one of the things we can do is we can try to trace the source of these. So here we have these Hopewell Mounds beads. And here we have a meteorite called a palisite. Anyone born in August? Yay, what's your birthstone? Peridot. Peridot, right, Peridot. So is the, is the French name. The mineral name is called olivine. This is extraterrestrial olivine. So this is your birthstone from a rock from outer space. And, <laughs> and so this meteorite is from a place called Brenham, Kansas. And it's a chemical match for these beads, which were recovered in Ohio. Keep in mind, Brenham, Kansas is here, south central Kansas. The Hopewell Mounds are over here, about 500 miles away. So another example of trade of material. But it's important because if you go to Brenham, Kansas today, you can still recover meteorites. This was a meteorite recovered in the 1930s here. And this was done in the, in the late 1990s, early 2000s. They drug this magnetometer across these fields identified a big hit, started digging a big hole, and boop, out comes a piece of the Brenham meteorite. So there have been tons of material recovered from Brenham. If you go to the Field Museum in Chicago, we only have a few of these beads. The Field Museum in Chicago has lots of these things, ads heads, beads, all kinds of things made from iron meteorites. So let me take you to the next place, because now we're going to get into the real meat of the matter. So I started working on this in 2007, finally published the paper last year, which George saw, amazingly, and <laughs> invited me to come talk about it. So there was a, a site called Havana, Illinois. It's on the Illinois River. And we're going to, just to put it in context, remember, up here is the Trempolo. And we'll probably come back to this map in a second, if not pretty quickly. So this was the Havana site. And this was mound number nine of the Havana site. Here's the Illinois River. This is a topographic map. So each of these are relief lines. So where you have all these tight lines together, that's a steep little hill. And this site, unfortunately, in, in about 1940, 1941, was um, slated for a power plant. There's a power plant there today. And so they came in with a bulldozer, and they leveled all these mounds. But before they did that, they did some what you call rescue archaeology. They came in and as quickly as they could surveyed the site. And they excavated human remains and funerary objects. And one of those was this. So these were the Havana beads. They look sort of somewhere you can see this is down the axis. So here's the tube shape. That's the central hole. And this is cut perpendicular to that, or parallel to that central axis. So you get this sort of big. And you can see the pattern in here, that Widmanstaaten pattern that I showed you before. You can see it in here, except it's deformed. And again, this is a centimeter cube, about half an inch across. So we were really curious 
if we could try to source where these beads came from, if we could learn something about that. So this is a plot, don't panic. We'll work our way through this, okay? So it's just a plot of nickel, which gets its, well, nickel, it's in nickels. It's also in dimes and quarters, so I don't know why they're called nickels. But anyway, nickel, and this is an element called gallium. Anyone even ever heard of gallium before? Oh, good. Okay, yeah, okay, good, chemistry nerds. So. If you ever had a solar panel or even a little calculator with a solar thing in it, it probably is powered by gallium. And we're only going to look at four of these. So here's the Havana composition. Don't worry about all this. Just recognize that in this space, there's so many iron meteorites. These are the compositions of about 1,000 iron meteorites. Here, you would never know what's going on. Here, you have a relatively sparse population. So we're just going to look at Edmonton, Havana, Anoka, and Carleton. Now, you don't need to know anything about the meteorites. What you need to know about is that iron meteorites are named for the place they come from. And so here it is on a map. So here's the Havana site. Here's Anoka, Edmonton, Kentucky, Anoka, Minnesota, and Carleton, Texas. None of them were particularly good fits. When they first described the Havana beads in the 1970s, one of the problems was each of these meteorites was known, Anoka, uh, Edmonton, and Carleton, from a single mass one iron meteorite. There's no evidence anything had been ever taken off. And in fact, Anoka was found while they were digging a sewer line several feet down. So no reason to think that Havana was actually related to any of these. But then in the 1990s, some people started doing some more excavation. They were digging another sewer line. And up comes another piece of the Anoka iron. So this is the iron. It's, it's finer grained than the last one I showed you. It has these minerals called schreibersite. This is a phosphide. Don't worry about it, because just remember phosphide and schreibersite, OK? And this thing's about that big around. It's about the size of a good-sized dinner platter. So we thought, OK, here, let, me, let me see. Uh, I'm going to go back a couple slides, because I want to show you this. So right here, the really interesting thing, when we started poking around, and it took me a while to find an old newspaper article that had been posted online, is that one of them was found in Anoka on this side of the river. The more recent one was found in Champlain, Minnesota, on the other side of the Mississippi River. So occasionally, when meteorites come into the atmosphere, they break up and many stones fall. <coughs> we call it a shower. Imagine thousands of years ago, maybe tens of thousands of years ago, there was a shower of iron meteorites across the Mississippi River. And the Mississippi River, it doesn't take a genius to figure out, if you follow down the Mississippi, the Mississippiwi, it hooks up with the Illinois River here. So you have a pathway for the movement of these. So we started doing some chemistry. Now, anyone watch Sesame Street when you're growing up? Have kids who watch Sesame Street? We're going to play my favorite Sesame Street game. Which one of these is not like the others? OK. <laughs> so here, these are a lot of elements, some of which may seem familiar, like platinum. You've probably heard of platinum or iron is Fe, or even copper, Cu. Others like rhenium, you've probably never heard of in your life. And, but for the most part, these are a pretty good fit, right? If you compare Anoka and Havana. A few aren't good fits, things like tungsten and phosphorus and silver. That's because those are concentrated in that mineral schreibersite, which is very sort of heterogeneously distributed. So there's no reason to think one little piece of that big would get the representative part of this. So we think that the Havana actually came from Anoka. But how do you make these beads, right? How do you actually manufacture these? So we decided, let's just see if we can make one. We had purchased a piece of Anoka years before. So we just took a piece, or yeah, piece of Anoka. So we just took a piece of Anoka, and we tried to make a bead using only what they would have had in the day. So we took some rocks. Archaeologists like to call them lithics. And we took a, a wood-fueled fire. Nothing with coal, nothing with you know, any kind of charcoal, just a wood fueled fire. And it's actually pretty easy to do. All you have to do is pound the snot out of it, heat it, pound the snot out of it, heat it, pound the snot out of it, heat it, and eventually you'll make a flattened sheet. After you do that for a while, you pick it up with a couple of sticks that look like chopsticks. You put it in a grooved rock, you, you bang on it for a while, it rolls into a perfect little bead, you pull the, the stick out, and boom, you've made a bead. And the reason I know how to do this is because I've worked with metal so much. But so had the Hopewell, because remember, they were master copper workers. And so they used that same technology to make these beads. And so we, this is the bead we made. This is a centimeter cube, less than half an inch again. So you can see, here's the cross section of the real bead. This is the cross section of the one we made with that deformed Widmanstaten pattern. So now we've learned a lot about the object. But what we really want to know about 
are the people. How did this thing get from up here to down there? And there are two schools of thought on this. And I'm going to give you an example. Don't panic again. One's called the Hopewell Interaction Sphere, and the other one is the Hopewell Expedition Resource. And we can think about this like Chief wants to make a cake. So <laughs> Chief is going to make this cake, right? And he decides to make the cake. He goes to Pinterest. He gets this really cool recipe. <laughs> and he decides he's going to make the cake. And he's making the cake, and he goes, I don't have any eggs, right? He needs two eggs. Now, he has two choices. Choice number one is he goes to his neighbor. He goes, hey, can I borrow a couple of eggs? He borrows a couple of eggs. He comes back with the eggs. He makes the cake. He goes, oh, the cake turned out really well. He takes a slice back to his neighbor and says, hey, try this Pinterest recipe, right? Now, that is the Hopewell interaction sphere. You're interacting with your neighbors to exchange goods and ideas, right? The alternative is chief needs the two eggs. And he does what guys would do. He goes, I'm just going to go buy a store and buy some eggs and be done with this, right? That's the Hopewell expeditionary resource. He's taking expedition to get the eggs, and he's bringing the eggs back, right? Now, if you are smart and paying attention, you will notice that this breaks down to his and her. <laughs> <laughs> and that was intentionally done by Jimmy Griffin at the University of Michigan when he came up with the Hopewell expeditionary resource to call it her. Now, of course, they're flipped. Because the Hopewell Expeditionary Resource, her, is what guys would do. And the Hopewell Interaction Sphere, his, is what women would do because they would talk to their neighbors. So what does any of this have to do with meteorites, to tell you the truth? Well, it's pretty simple. If you're looking at a resource like galena or copper or mica or whelk shells or obsidian, we know there's a lot of it there. Even with something like the Brenham meteorite, if you go there, you're going to find it. You know where to go. You know where to pick it up. You know where to get it. These could be either model. But if you've got a one-off meteorite, something that fell as a small shower across the Mississippi, there's only one way to get that, and that's the interaction sphere. Because nobody is going to set out down a river, up another river, looking for that. That was found by someone locally and traded. And so I want to leave you with three slides, which to me are so terribly obvious and yet so pro profoundly important. The first of which is we study these as objects. But what I really want to point out is that what we're studying are the people. These are people that don't have a voice anymore. We don't know who they were. We don't know what they called themselves. We don't know what language they spoke. And when we study these, and we do it both scientifically rigorously and with respect for the people that had this, because it's not just an object. It's the hands of the people who found the meteorite. It's the hands of the people who traded the meteorite. It's the hands of the people who made the, the beads. It's the person who wore them, and ultimately the person with whom they were buried. When we do that, we give voice back to these people. And in many ways, I think it's equivalent to what we're doing now with the Miami Center, trying to give voice and, and substance back to our community in some respects. And what are those voices saying to us? What have we learned about these people? Well, some of these in red are things that I think we can say from this. Exotic objects were recognized as valuable. Ability to recognize even meteorites. They had advanced metalworking technology. They had complex systems of trades and good goods and ideas. And those trades extended over most of North America, at least the eastern half of North America. And some things more generally. They undertook complex engineering projects. They built the Serpent Mound. They maintained it over a 1,000 years, right? They devoted significant manpower to these projects. Now, that might not, might not mean much to you, but if you have people who are working on that project, then there have to be other people who are supporting them with food and goods and housing and everything else, right? They undertook all those. They maintained these structures, and they established centers over much of the eastern half of the continent. What do all these things point to? These are complex societies. Now, that may not mean much to you. It may be obvious in this room. But that's the reason it's so important, is because it should be obvious in this room, and we have to present that to other people. There are a lot of people who think our ancestors and the people who lived on our land, perhaps even before our ancestors, were primitive people. They spoke a few hundred words. They were hunter-gatherers. They were incapable of doing anything. I mean, my least favorite TV show on all of any network ever is on the unfortunately named History Channel with a show called Ancient Aliens whose entire hypothesis 
is that our ancestors were so stupid that only aliens could have helped them build these structures. It's ridiculous, <laughs> utterly ridiculous. And so if any of you watch it, I'm sorry, but that's my... <laughs> and keep in mind, these complex societies haven't existed for decades or hundreds of years. They've existed for thousands of years on our lands. And what we call Miyamiyangi, complex societies, societies where people took care of each other, undertook major projects, did these important things, have existed for thousands of years. And that's the message I want to leave you with. Thank you.